the combine is over and the lottery is decided so let's get into a new mock draft this is floor and ceiling let's break it down With the first pick of the 2024 NBA Draft, the Atlanta Hawks select Alex Saar. The Hawks were the biggest winners of the draft lottery, coming away with the first overall pick despite only having a 3% chance to do so beforehand. Saar is a 7'1 French big who played for the Perth Wildcats in the Australian NBL this past season. His profile is definitely intriguing, largely because of his mix of rim protection, mobility, length, and more expansive flashes off the dribble. This is personally a few spots higher than I'll end up having Saar on my personal big board, but I very much do understand the appeal in Atlanta. The front court fit next to Jalen Johnson will be dangerous defensively in the short term, and should Sar's glimpses of ball handling and shooting pan out in a more real way, then that should also be a very versatile pairing in terms of offensive production. Trey Young's future in Atlanta is in question, but if he stays, I think that would be massively helpful for Sar, who at this point really needs to be set up for almost all of his buckets. However, if Trey leaves, then the Hawks are still getting a very appealing two-way big who most teams have near the top of their draft boards. With the second pick, the Washington Wizards select Donovan Klingon. Pick number two is where I'm expecting this draft to completely open up, especially after the Hawks snatched up the first pick. In all honesty, the Wizards have a difficult decision on their hands here. Their team, to put it bluntly, is not good at all, and they're in the middle of a gradual rebuild. Really, I think the only actual long-term piece of their roster should be Bilal Koulibaly, and then maybe Denny Avdia or Kyle Kuzma, but I think they're movable if a big offer comes in. It was pretty tempting to have DC draft Zachary Rissacher here. He would be another long, rangy wing with two-way potential, which the Wizards definitely seem to like as a player archetype. But since I'm operating under the thought that Washington will not be a good team in the near future, they should have another top 5-ish pick in the 2025 NBA Draft. If that's the case, and like we'll break down on the channel, you have primary initiator, star potential prospects there such as Cooper Flagg, Ace Bailey, VJ Edgecombe, or Dylan Harper coming up. Instead, I'll wait for a wing-sized initiator next year and aim to solve Washington's problems in the paint with Donovan Klingon. The Yukon Center is a bruiser at the basket who dominated the rim on both ends at the college level. His injury history is a concern, plus Klingon's switchability and versatility is limited to some extent, but with this pick, the Wizards would be getting a surefire NBA big who will have a long career while also fitting the bigger picture of what their team needs. With the third pick, the Houston Rockets select Zachary Rissaché. Rissaché has a chance of going in the top two in real life, and I think his absolute floor is number four to San Antonio. Here, I'll have the Rockets draft him one pick earlier, and actually, this would be one of my favorite fits of the night. The way I'm looking at things, Houston should be seeking a player who is comfortable off the ball while providing three-point shooting, rebounding, and defensive potential. Rizache should bring all of this to the table nearly immediately. In fact, I think he could slot into the same role that he's been playing for Borg, but for the Rockets in the pretty short term. I would like to emphasize how comfortable the Frenchman is playing off the ball. He shoots spot ups, he cuts hard to the rim, and he plays fast in transition. I think that the Rockets' touches should go through Fred Van Vliet, Alpin and Shengun, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, and eventually Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore, so I would prefer avoiding a ball dominant player. Rizache is exactly that. And finally, I think a big bonus for him compared to other guys I've heard here such as Reed Shepard is Rizache's size, length, and positional defense. With the fourth pick, the San Antonio Spurs select Rob Dillingham. 
Dillingham is likely the most tantalizing prospect in this year's draft. He has all the means to be an incredibly dynamic and unique shot maker and advantage creator. Rob can light up a defense quickly and he has the tools and touch to make wild shots from all over the floor. But at the same time, he's small, he's a little bit caught in between the one and the two guard, he has a very slight frame, he plays no NBA defense really, and his shot selection and playmaking habits are absolutely going to need improvement. However, if I'm San Antonio, I cannot miss out on the opportunity to pair Dillingham with Victor Wembanyama. That would have the potential to be one of the most mercurial, creative duos ever, I think, and with Wemby protecting the basket as well as after adding some other pieces, I think the Spurs could insulate Dillingham defensively. However, the big thing here is that I'm not convinced that this fourth pick will still belong to the Spurs come draft night. A trade with the Atlanta Hawks centered around Trey Young seems very likely in my opinion, but I'm working this mock draft, acting like everything will remain the same as per the lottery. With the fifth pick, the Detroit Pistons select Dalton Connect. This is leaning on the very high range for the Tennessee scorer, and he's closer to the double digits in the lottery on my big board. But I actually really like this fit in Detroit because Connect addresses two big issues. The first one is scoring. Connect will help the piston spacing because he can put the ball in the hoop in a variety of ways. From three, he can make movement shots, harder catch and shoots, and easier spot ups. He also shows real skill off the bounce using his sweet jumper to shoot over defenders or his athleticism to create advantages and use a ball screen here and there. All of this should be helpful for Cade Cunningham, and it's also scalable next to Asar Thompson, Jalen Duran, and Jaden Ivey. The second issue that Connect can help with is production. The Pistons are in a very rough spot, so the team needs someone who is going to be able to come in and contribute almost right away. At 23 years old, and after 5 years of genuine growth in college, I wouldn't mind Detroit selecting Connect this early, and I could see this making a lot of sense. With the 6th pick, the Charlotte Hornets select Stefan Castle. The UConn playmaker can come into the league, and he has a clear role with the Hornets acting as a connector between their point guard in LaMelo Ball and their scorer of the future in Brandon Miller. The Hornets already have two very good young pieces, but they need help in improving the environment around their ball club. Charlotte has been a losing franchise for forever, it seems, but Castle's motor, defensive dexterity, facilitating, and off-ball scoring could help turn that around. I know Castle has mentioned that he wants to be a point guard in the NBA after playing as more of an off-ball wing at UConn, but I really don't think that's his long-term outcome. Looking at last year's draft and how his rookie season panned out, a role like a Men Thompson in which Castle still gets reps on the ball, but also fits in holes all around the floor, is a likelier scenario. With the seventh pick, the Portland Trailblazers select Modest Brazelis. There are a couple of other wings at play here, namely Ron Holland and Cody Williams, I think in that particular order, but what ultimately sets Buzelis apart for me is his floor and ceiling as a shooter. Although the Lithuanian American prospect did not shoot the ball well during his sole season with the G League Ignite, I think he will be a pretty good shooter from deep. At the very least, Modest should be able to make the relatively easy catch and shoot looks, but he's also shown enough to me to make me believe in more. Buzelis has flashes pulling up off the bounce, putting the ball on the floor using his vertical athleticism, improved frame, and better handle, and from time to time, he'll also play make for others. These are small flashes for now, and I'm not sure how functional they would be early on on an NBA floor, but since Portland has defense covered with Matisse Thybul, Tumani Kamara, hopefully Ryan Ruper, and others for the future, I'm opting for Buzelis, who should be passable if not good on D, but he also has the means to explode on the other end. 
With the eighth pick, the San Antonio Spurs select Tijan Salon. This might be a bit of a home run selection, but I actually think it can make a lot of sense down the line for San Antonio. As soon as the Spurs won the Victor Wembanyama sweepstakes last year, everything in the franchise naturally started to revolve around him. Of course, both Wemby and Salon are French, their families, in particular their sisters, have known each other for a long time, and of course they share the same agency. All of those things should absolutely be factored in, let's be honest. But from an on-court perspective, I think Salon gives the Spurs multi-positionality that does not currently exist on the roster. At around 6'10 and still growing, with a 7 plus foot wingspan and a moldable skill set, the Frenchman should be able to play 3 to 5. I believe that Salon could upgrade on the concept of Jeremy Sohan with the potential to slide up and down positions on both ends, more functional athleticism, and similar do-it-all flashes. The big question with this pick, which could be considered risky, is how quickly Salon could be a meaningful contributor for the Spurs. He's really starting to put things together now in the French League and he learns quickly, but he is still fairly raw, especially as far as the NBA is concerned. Of course, all of this also depends on the Spurs timeline. If they compete quicker, then Salon could be stashed and developed in the G League. But if that takes longer, then he should be in the mix to get some NBA reps. With the ninth pick, the Memphis Grizzlies select Ron Holland. At this point of the draft, this for me is the best player available who fits in with the Grizzlies core. Holland is a really intriguing prospect because his one standout NBA skill right now is no doubt his motor, but he's also super young and he's really made strides over the last few seasons as a shot maker, ball handler, and overall high volume initiator. The Ignite Wing's safest outcome is probably as a connective and athletic energy wing, but I also believe that there is a real path out there towards Holland becoming more of an on-ball primary or second initiator with the tools to be impactful on both ends. For this to happen, however, Ron will need to improve his decision making, iron out his rash defending, and really start seeing more of the floor. I've seen Holland slide across some big boards be criticized, but generally I think it was justified after a pretty rough season. In theory, there are also some guards available here like Isaiah Collier, Nikola Topic, or Reed Shepard, but since Memphis has John Morant who is already consolidated as an all-star for seasons to come, I'm just not that fond of the idea of pairing him with any other guard who is either small, ball dominant, or a shaky shooter. With the 10th pick, the Utah Jazz select Isaiah Collier. This would be a massive steal for me because the USC point guard is legitimately still in contention to be number one on my final big board. Other than Collier being the best player available, I also think that he would mesh in nicely with what the Jazz are doing. Utah's ongoing rebuild revolves around Laurie Markkinen and then Keontae George and maybe Taylor Hendricks or Bryce Sensabaugh. With Collier, the team would be getting a physical downhill point guard who in my opinion will be at worst a top 3 NBA passer in this draft class. Markkinen is at his best when he's being set up and the Trojans playmaker can certainly do that so I think their games could fit in very well together down the line. Collier's shot has long been the question about him, but I think he'll eventually become a solid enough volume shooter, and I didn't find his turnover problems early on in the year to be that worrying. Drafting Collier could also get even more out of Keontae George by allowing him to handle less on-ball responsibilities and instead thrive as a bucket getter. With the 11th pick, the Chicago Bulls select Nikola Topic. I think that the Bulls badly need to start over, and I know that there are rumblings about bringing DeMar DeRozan back, but I think it would really benefit the organization to start acquiring a brand new look. 
It also seems like Zach Levine will move on from Chicago soon. So I think everything becomes flexible after that, which also includes Lonzo Ball, Alex Caruso, and Nikola Vucevic. Chicago has some nice young prospects in Kobe White or Patrick Williams, and they should be factored in, but also they should not be considered unmovable. So if the Bulls have the chance to take Topic at 11, they should pounce on that, because he has some star potential for a franchise that really needs an injection. I have significant questions about Topic when it comes to his defense and his pull-up shooting, but he's no doubt a great point guard. He has highly impressive production as a teenager, and he has a genuine case to be considered the best passer in this draft. If the Serbian prospect gets into an environment where he is the primary initiator without having to fit in around an already established point guard, then this could end up being one of the best picks of the night. With the 12th pick, the Oklahoma City Thunder select Cody Williams. This, yet again, is where things got really dicey for me because there were multiple names that I was heavily considering. That includes Reed Shepard, Kyle Filipowski, Jared McCain, Devin Carter, Kashawn George out of Miami, and even Zach Eady. Ultimately though, I think the Thunder will continue to covet positional size and length, which Shepard and McCain do not have. Devin Carter has a more similar athletic profile, and I love the fit but there could be some overlap with Case and Wallace. Keyshawn George might be too undefined still for an OKC team that is already making deep playoff runs. And I just don't buy the idea that OKC will draft a paint-bound big. Instead, I'm going with Cody Williams. Sure, it helps that his brother is Jalen Williams, but outside of that, Cody has the traits that the Thunder typically likes. I'm also thinking that there might be an opening on the wing relatively soon in OKC. Usman Jang needs to stick next season, Aaron Wiggins could eventually be tempted by other teams, and if Josh Giddy is moved on, which seems probable down the line, then that probably moves Kaysen Wallace onto more of an on-ball role. Should any of these things happen, you can have Cody Williams come in, develop over a couple of seasons, and then fit into what OKC more or less already looks for at the wing. With the 13th pick, the Sacramento Kings select Kyle Filipowski. Again, I really considered Reed Shepard here, but I just did not love the fit next to De'Aaron Fox or Domantas Sabonis. I think Fox and Shepard together might be too easy to penetrate, and I'm not sure that the Kentucky guard has the athletic means to make up for Sabonis' limitations. I've opted for Flip, who I believe can give Sacramento continuity off the bench at the 4 or the 5. He's a type of big, somewhat comparable to Sabonis in that he can run dribble handoffs, push in transition after rebounding, make some creative reads, and probably stretch the floor a bit. The Blue Devils forward probably won't excel at any one of these things, but he should be a versatile attacker comparable to Kelly Olynyk or Mo Wagner, who competes and moves on defense despite his physical shortcomings. I do think Filipowski can play next to Sabonis, but even if this pick just means solidifying your rotation center, I think that can be a pretty successful selection. With the 14th pick, the Portland Trail Blazers select Reed Shepard. In all likelihood, I'm aware that Shepard will probably go higher on draft night. He has a chance to go in the top three, but this is actually right around where I have Reed on my big board. I'll acknowledge that this is a bit lower than most. There is a lot to like with Shepard, don't get me wrong, his percentages were unbelievable, he can facilitate for his teammates, and he can create events on defense. His freshman season at Kentucky was amazing, and I've never really seen anything like it. However, I continue to have some very real concerns about Reed's self-creation, athleticism against NBA defenders, finishing at the basket, and defensive translation. In Portland, he could be a great sort of third guard next to Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simons, 
but there would also be a chance for Shepard to lead bench units and play in creative lineups with the bevy of ball handlers that Portland has. Shepard would also add more shooting, since Portland will take all the spacing that it can get, and I think he would be allowed to shine defensively. The team, theoretically, has enough size, length, and twitch at both the wings and the big positions, so I think that the Kentucky Guard's defensive improvement points could be covered for, and Shepard could shine getting steals and blocks.